is Elliot Sabel. I'm a postdoc here in, at Stony Brook University with the Frisk Lab. And my research focuses on uh, winter flounder dynamics and trying to explore the drivers of the recent collapse of winter flounder in the northeast uh, shelf of the US. Um, so during this talk, I'll cover most of the topics that have been mentioned during the plenary sessions, such as ecosystem-based management, such as uh, the effect of fisheries, um, and some of uh, the dynamics that you, we, I'm going to show here already have been presented, so the collapse of winter flounder, for example. But let's start at the beginning. Fisheries are a major driver of stock collapses in the world, and here I have five examples. Capelin in the Barents Sea in uh, the 80s, 90s, uh, was triggered by overfishing. Herring in the North Sea collapse uh, due to overfishing. Atlantic cod in the North Sea also collapsed due to fisheries. Um, we have multiple examples of fish stocks that collapse in the Mediterranean Sea. And finally, closer to our area, we have the, Atlant the uh, Atlantic cod of Canadian coast that also collapsed due to overfishing. So very simple here, just a graph to show you, very basic, what's happening if you increase fisheries or if you decrease fisheries. In uh, dark, you have what's happening in terms of spawning stock biomass if you decrease fishing by half. In uh, light gray, you have the effects of fishing on biomass if you double the uh, fishing mortality. And I mean, this is pretty obvious. If you increase fisheries, you decline the um, biomass of the different species. And this is more visible here for higher trophic level. And you decrease the biomass, you increase the biomass if you divide the fishing effort by two. Again, for higher trophic levels, because these are the species that are triggered, that are targeted by uh, fisheries. But uh, we have an issue in management is that we are focusing on single species approaches. But again, we have another issue, is that stocks are much more complicated than just a bunch of individuals that are swimming around. And we need to account for that in our, in our methods. Here I have the example for the Atlantic cod in the North Sea. And for a while, everyone thought that Atlantic cod collapsed fisheries due to fisheries. And, and what recent research uh, showed is that, in fact, we didn't have a single stock but we had meta populations in uh, the North Sea cod stock. So what happened is that there is connectivity, there's connection between the different meta populations, but the different meta populations are having dynamics that are not evolving at the same pace. So here, for example, on top here, this is what we call the Viking meta population, and the Viking meta population you see here has not too much decline in biomass over the time, right? And then you have here the southwest that's over here. You see a strong decline over the time period 1985 to 2005 in spawning stock biomass for cod. So these two figures just show that depending on where you are in the North Sea, you're going to have different rates of decline between the different meta populations. So what we need to do, because there's not only this aspect, but it's much more complicated than that. We have multiple drivers, we have climate change, pollution, and so on. We need to go towards a more ecosystem-based approach. We need to account for multiple drivers, so pollution, fisheries, offshore wind, offshore drilling for uh, gas. We need also to account for shipping, and so on. There's a lot of different stressors due to human activities. And we want to understand what is their impact on the ecosystems. But again, we have a problem. Ecosystems are complicated. So we need to find a way to represent the state of the ecosystem. And we're going to do that by looking at different indicators, like stability, productivity, diversity, and trophic structure, for example. And based on these metrics, 
we're going to have an idea of the quality, the health, and uh, we're going to be able to assess the state of the ecosystem over time. Okay, based on these, uh, the, these assessments, we're going to derive political decisions, which are going to lead to management decisions. And if the management plan is done in a proper way, we're going to have these loops that describe an adaptive management process where we're going to have management decisions on different drivers and assess the effect on the, of the management decisions on the ecosystem and so on. Right? So, sorry. So that's uh, what we call ecosystem-based management. And again, this is just to show what I just mentioned. So we need to define clear objectives when we do ecosystem-based management. We need to develop the indicators, assess the ecosystem state, analyze the uncertainty and risk, go back to all the science to feed into defining new goals, defining new indicators, defining a new method to assess ecosystems, and new method to assess uncertainty and risk of, uh, in the ecosystem. One way of doing this because we often lack data, we have a lot of data for commercial species, but we don't have a lot of data for non-commercial species, and we need to find a way to assess the state of the ecosystem with, with, the, with the data we have. And one method that we have is to use ecosystem models, such as Ecopath, such as Atlantis, and so on. Okay, but for these methods, we have an issue, and the issue is just in the assumptions of these models. So here there are two questions I'm going to ask, and I'm going to show you why ecopath and Atlantis are not always perfect to address ecosystem-based management issues um, in that case. So first, are ecosystem models capable of reproducing the dynamics of ecosystem components? And the second question, are ecosystem models capable of grasp, uh, yeah, grasping small-scale variability of natural systems? Right? I show you the output of a very, very recent study with Ecopath. Okay, I'm just taking here, let me see where, so this is, okay, this is north, uh, northeastern cod, so Atlantic cod in Norway. And you see here that, so cod is a very highly commercial species in Norway. And you see here that so the blue is what Ecopath has simulated, the black is the observations. What you see is that we don't have a perfect fit. Okay, that's the first thing. We might have some of the trends in the simulated trajectories, but we're not capable of reproducing these large variations in uh, what we observe, right? Even um, worse is when you take Juvenile species, here it's Haddock, from year 0 to 2. The ball simulates something that's flat, with small variation here. If you look at what we've observed here, that's definitely not matching. Okay? And one explanation for the, the issues that Ecopaz has to reproduce this variability lies in two questions. Is first is how Ecopass is managing uncertainties in the data and the processes. And the second one is how it manages stochasticity. Okay, so in, in both cases, what's happening is that uncertainty is not taken into account in it to Ecopath. We're taking it after we've simulated and we analyze this uncertainties. Then for the stochasticity, well, we have to run multiple simulation with Ecopath, with different values of parameters, and then see what's coming out, if there's an effect. And here, we have a problem because the stochasticity is a key element of natural systems. Here I take an example of a recent study um, that tried to understand the drivers of recruitment of herring in the Norwegian Sea. And here you can see that first, recruitment of herring is very variable from year to year. And second, in this study, they just showed that most of the drivers we thought were responsible for this variation are actually not. And that the best element that could explain these drivers 
with the knowledge we have is stochasticity. The other aspect that we often don't take into account is massive mortality events. If I take the example here in the area, the massive die-off of lobster in the Long Island Sound, no one could have planned it. In one year, most of the stock died. And this is, you can't plan it, that's not possible. And finally, the extreme case, like dinosaurs, you have a meteorite coming in, destroying everything, a lot of stocks going down. This is the consistency, you can't plan it, okay? But if you take basic ecosystem models that are used on a day-to-day -day basis, they don't account for this. Okay, so my objective here is to present to you a modeling framework called chance and necessity that accounts for stochasticity in the systems while also accounting for what we know about the system. So on the contrary to what Ecopass is doing, where we're gonna describe all the processes and then make uncertainty analysis on the output, here uncertainty is the core of the model. We integrate it in the way we build our model. Okay, so the model framework was developed in three steps. The first one was um, in a paper published in 2009, where they developed a model that was non-deterministic, but we added constraints that represented key physiological and biological processes in the system, such as satiation, inertia, so the maximum variability and the max well the maximum variability of your system. Um, yeah, the second step was in 2017, where they applied this model to the Barron Sea ecosystem. And here, what they added is the stochastic. So basically, you define your constraints, and you restrain the range of possible uh, solutions that you have and you're going to stochastically sample the solutions out of your system and we're going to do that 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 times so that we can explore the range of, pos of possible trajectories of your system. Okay? Last development is the most recent one from 2020 is at that point we, that we start calling them CAN models and this one was just used to uh, do assessment. So we're going to reconstruct past trajectories of the system using chance and necessity modeling. So we're going to have the exact same constraints, and we're going to add all the data we have, stock assessment outputs, landings data, uh, diets data, uh, diets proportion data, and so on, to constrain further the state space of your system to reduce the range of possible solutions of your system. Okay, so very quickly how it works. It's a food web model, so it's based on energy transfer or biomass transfer from one species to another, and it's mass balance, meaning that in all cases, you need to respect this equation. What comes in minus what comes out must be equal at the difference of biomass from one year to another. Okay, when we have trophic flows, you need to account that some of the elements are not absorbed by the predator, that the predator is losing biomass due to metabolism, that you have export of biomass from one ecosystem to another, but you also have import from one ecosystem to, to the present ecosystem for your species. Okay, the next step, what we're gonna do, once we have defined all our constraints, I'm going to specify them on the next slide. We're going to sample just the trophic flows. So the solutions of the system are not the biomass of the different species. They are the trophic exchange between species. Okay? And again, we're going to do that 10,000, 100,000 times to, have to explore the whole range of possibilities in the system. So the constraints we have, two types of constraints. This is the basic constraints I mentioned. You have constraints on the trophic flows, and you have constraints on the biomass. On the trophic flows, you have cessation. Positive flows, basically, cessation, you're limited in the amount you can eat. 
positive flows is a prey cannot eat a predator. Pretty simple and clear. Inertia I mentioned on the biomass, it's how much the biomass can increase or decrease from one time step to another. And refuge biomass is a constraint we added um, to reduce issues, so computational issues. If you come to a very low biomass for some species, when I say low, it's extremely low biomass, this is the, the algorithm is not capable of finding a solution. Okay, so we just tell him, set a value to something low, and he can't go below that. And then we're gonna count how many times he crashes on this, on this limit. If it's too many, it means the system is not sustainable, right? In the camp, what, so sorry, what we can do, that's what I mentioned, we are gonna explore the dynamics. So we're gonna start at some point in time, and we're gonna simulate future trajectories. And we're just gonna explore the dynamics. And here, you don't have to focus on this black thick line. What you need to focus on is the dashed line that you see here, because this is reflecting the variability of your system. Okay, this is the same here. The red line is observations. Okay, if the observations are outside what you've simulated, it means you have a problem. And you're gonna focus on the dashed line. So here you have one with very high pelagic fish, one with average and then increasing, and one with very low biomass. Okay, for CAM, we added more constraints that are based on data. So on flows, you're gonna constrain that by stomach content data for a specific year, you say on that year, the trophic flow between cod and uh, whale is so much because I found a whale that had so much and I extrapolate or something and I have this data with some uncertainty and I'm putting that in the, in the model. I have diet analysis, I have diet proportion and landings. Okay, that's I already mentioned before. On biomass, we're gonna have other constraint based on stock access model outputs. We're gonna take the model outputs, we're gonna put them in it with, in the model with the uncertainties, and we're gonna simulate that. What we can do with that is that we can reconstruct past trajectories of the system. Okay, so here in this example, the outside lines here are the uncertainties. I cannot go outside of these lines because this is the maximum uncertainty for this species. The black line, again, is the median one. But again, what I'm interested in is all these small lines varying a lot here in the middle. It means, for this case, for demersal fish, or here for mammals, it's more visible. Given all the information I have, although I'm not constraining mammals much in my mall, given the available amount of food for mammals, and given the amount of fisheries, the dynamics of mammals cannot be more variable than this. Although my maximum variability here is this one. And with that, I'm gonna take the, the flows, I'm gonna take the biomass, and I'm gonna be able to derive my indicators, my metrics. So here what, I've, what we've done, is we've looked at traffic control, here we've looked at traffic control over time, how it's varying, and we actually highlighted that we had cycles where top down and bottom up were, uh, were varied, were shifting over time. This is what we have with the RCAN model, so the more constrained version, where we here clearly see the cycles. Okay, this was between cod and pelagic fish. Okay, the other thing you can look into is because you have the trophic flows, you can look at the correlation between consumption, so everything that comes in the system, so in the, in the group, in the species, and how much biomass is varying. And that's another way of looking at traffic control in the system. So to have a, a more applied aspect in this presentation, my work will focus, uh, so my work here at Stony Brook focuses on winter flounder dynamics. This graph we already saw this morning with the decline of winter flounder in uh, the early 80s with a very low bias spawning stock biomass recently. Um, so it's a five-fold uh, five decline in spawning stock biomass. And the question is simple, is what are the drivers? 
So options we have here on the left is increasing temperature triggered a decline in um, an increase in mortality of larvae, leading to a decline in the spawning stock biomass. The option here that we have is that the adults have been overfished for a long, long time. Okay? And my work here is going to address a third question, is can the reoccurrence of predators such as summer flounder for larval winter flounder be responsible for higher predation on larval winter flounder, triggering a decline in the species biomass? Okay, so very quickly, the next step we're gonna, we did was to build an expert group with people, experts on winter flounder, on landings, on winter flounder dynamics, on modeling part. We've built a food web. So this is the food web. We're just going to focus on winter flounder adults, winter flounder pulse settlement, so year zero to one, and then just young of the year. And uh, eggs and larvae, sorry. We have some data here. We have biological and physical, physiological parameters that are derived from theory. We have constraint based on observations. And then here, this is the time series that we've used. And just to show you what we have, this is the reconstructions that I have right now. This is very preliminary. This is the spawning stock biomass. And you see here that the trends that you have here are very similar to the one that you have here. But again, this is very hard to see here, but you see that you have trajectories inside the system here that are not following the average, but it's varying within the uncertainty range that we've defined. And also, very important, we have all the flows, like we have the landings here, we're quite sure about, we have settlement, we have recruitment, and spawning, and these are very interesting because we're going to be able to compare that to more theoretical models on recruitment and spawning, uh, for example, and compare what we should have in terms of recruitment based on the knowledge we have with what theoretical models are giving. And that was it. So, thank you.